coined by Ozymandias Ramses for regulars in the skeptic circles. He's a familiar voice who doesn't need any introduction, but for those unfamiliar, Ozzy, could you provide us with a brief introduction of yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a YouTuber. My YouTube handle is uh, Ozymandias Ramses II. Um, I'm an atheist, and um, I have a background in academic philosophy, specifically analytic epistemology. Um, and uh, I'm sort of I make videos that, that are have to do with theism and atheism and, and all that sort of uh, of issue, mostly in connection with um, where where these touch on specifically philosophical questions, especially having to do with uh, epistemology. Uh, I, I'm sort of uh, broadening my uh, my interest a little bit uh, to include other questions besides epistemology, you know, moral questions and the like. Excellent. All right, great. So on the most recent episode of the Magic Sandwich Show, of which you're a pretty frequent contributor, you had a great conversation about burdens of proof and how atheists lately seem to be getting it wrong. You said that we're guilty as charged of playing hide the ball and are hasty in our unwillingness to give the justification for our position. So if you could elaborate, exactly what position does an atheist have that needs justifying? Sure. Um, oh, that's a really good question. It's very pointed. Um, okay. Well, I mean, traditionally the word atheism uh, in modern languages has meant the rejection of theism, not merely not believing theism, but actually the rejection of theism, the, the view that there is no God. And there are all kinds of people who don't believe in a God, uh, but not all of them are atheists. Agnostics, for instance, really resent being called atheists because they typically view themselves as being on the fence. They, they neither have a belief in a God, nor do they have a belief that there's no God. They're really sort of on the fence. And it has nothing to do with sort of certainty one way or the other. They just really can't make up their minds. And then there are Huxleyan agnostics who think that the whole question is, you know, undecidable uh, in principle, not just that they lack the evidence one way or the other to reach a decision, uh, but that, in fact, uh, such a decision can never be rationally uh, warranted one way or the other. So those are sort of Huxleyan agnostics. Um, Thomas Henry Huxley is the fellow who actually coined the phrase, the term agnostic. And then there are people who are igtheists or theological non-cognitivists who think that the all of the discourse of faith, the entire discourse about God, is um, so poorly defined, so poorly understood, so fraught with equivocation and essentially um, a meaningless terminology that that you can't even get as far as being an atheist because you can't even define what what a what a god is clearly and cogently and so the position is that the concept is incoherent and consequently can, no one can be can get as far as being a theist or an atheist so they reject the, those labels um, so there you don't have to be either a theist or an atheist I mean there's either a god or there's no god but it doesn't follow from that that the only two doxastic or belief states with respect to the question of God's existence that, that that's a binary uh, that doesn't have to be a binary position um, and uh, atheism is in, in modern languages has always been understood as the the view that there is no God or that there are no gods um, in antiquity the, the the word had different uh, connotations, but in, in modern languages, it just means the view that there's no God. Now, to say that there's no God, or if you believe that there's no God, uh, what you're you're doing there is you're making a claim about reality. You're not claiming to be certain. You can be you can think it's probabilistically true that that there's no God, but in any case, that's a claim about reality. And claims about reality, if they're not to be sort of dismissed, um, have to be uh, warranted. One has to have a reason, a rational reason for thinking that the claim is true. And this is just sort of a general principle, a general condition of rationality, that a, a position is only rational if there are reasons that one can put forward, good reasons, not, not just any old crappy reasons, but good reasons for um, that belief. And if you don't do that, then you have, by definition, an unwarranted position. So if atheists want to sort of think of themselves, as I do, um, uh, as uh, holding a rational position, there have to be reasons why you think no God. Now, if you're someone who thinks, well, I just lack a belief in God, well, if you lack a belief in God, then maybe perhaps you're an agnostic or maybe you're an, an atheist or something like that. Uh, and um, it, it all depends on, on, on what it is that you're prepared to assert, though. But if you're the kind of person who lacks a belief in a God, but who also goes around saying, Gods don't exist. Gods aren't real. God is a delusion. Gods are myths. Gods are human inventions. They're figments of, of the human imagination and things like that. 
if you're the kind of atheist that says that, those are the kinds of things that I might say, um, then you are in fact making a claim about reality, that reality includes no gods. And claims about reality, be they positive or negative, have to be rationally warranted and justified. So the, the burden that, that befalls an atheist, as I see it, is not the burden of establishing or demonstrating conclusively and irrefutably that a God exists. The only time you have to satisfy that burden is if you go around saying you can prove that a God doesn't exist and it's impossible. But if you don't think gods are impossible, you just think gods just aren't actual, that there's no reason to think that, they're, that they exist, then you have to give reasons why you think that gods don't exist. And you can point to the lack of evidence, and pointing to the lack of evidence for a god is, in fact, part of discharging your, your burden of justification. So, as I see it, it's a question of burden of justification. The, the expression burden of proof makes it sound like you've got to decisively prove something. But, I mean, a, a, a theist doesn't have to decisively prove that there's a god to be warranted. They just have to give good reasons. I happen to think that there ultimately are not such good reasons, and so I think ultimately theism is not ultimately objectively um, uh, a rational position. Um, I think it always rests on on errors at some point. Uh, but uh, whether you're a theist or an atheist, you, you have to discharge the burden of the claim that you're making. And it doesn't matter how what you're prepared to say and what you're not prepared to say. It's it's a question of what you what you actually believe, what you think in your heart is the case. And if you want your beliefs to be warranted, you have to have reasons for for that claim. So that that's what I think that we need to do. We need to be able to rationally support why we think what we think to whatever degree of confidence we think it is and if you think gods are impossibilities well that's a huge burden of justification sure but i but i think that simply thinking that a, a god doesn't exist is not a very huge burden to discharge i think it's actually fairly trivial to discharge that that burden of justification oh. uh and we shouldn't let ourselves be uh sort of stonewalled into uh into having to defend the claim that you can prove that god doesn't exist that that you know, the only person that has to prove that who has that as their burden of justification is the person who actually asserts that, and most atheists don't. Gotcha. Well, there's quite a bit there to unpack. I wanted to go back on something you touched on, that growing contingent of strong atheists, some going as far to assert definitively, like you said, that there is no God. That's quite strong language. Have, have they bitten off more than they can chew? Uh, in my view, they have, yeah. Um, and I, I want to make it clear that I'm not suggesting that one has to satisfy certain conditions to be an atheist. All you have to do to, do to be an atheist is think that there is no God, uh, f whatever your reasons. I mean, you can be an atheist for good reasons or terrible reasons, just as you can be you know, a Democrat or a liberal or a Republican or whatever for good or bad reasons. Um, it's just a question of what you think is true about reality. Um, but in the case of uh, so-called strong atheists or positive atheists or Gnostic atheists, people who assert that not only that gods don't exist, but that they know that a god doesn't exist or that they can demonstrate or establish the impossibility of any and all gods, that I think is a burden that is, I mean, it's a huge burden. I don't know um, of any satisfactory proof that would rule out even the logical possibility of God's existence. I think that's, those people I think are, are making a mistake. They're, they really are, they really are um, biting off too uh, more than, more than they can choose, simply because proving the impossibility of things that are bare uh, possibilities uh, is, is too tall a task. I mean, there's an infinity of things that one could posit to be true without evidence. I mean, Russell's teapot is an example of that. The, the flying spaghetti monster, the invis invisible pink unicorn, these are all ways of illustrating to theists that, listen, the world is full of things that are logically possible, but they're not actual. Um, and we don't have to rule out things that are logically possible. So I think that those atheists are, are really going too far. It's up to them. If that's what you believe, then of course, then that's what you believe. And then in which case you have to try and justify that. But I think that that that's really an unjustifiable position. I, I don't know how to get there. I, I've heard such arguments, but I find them un, unpersuasive. It's quite a tall order. So in, in your example, you gave a Bigfoot example where you suggested that the absence of evidence where one would expect to find it is in fact, doesn't in fact imply evidence of absence. Playing the theist advocate, they may say, well, who's to say where one should expect to find it? Yeah. Um, okay. Well, let me unpack that. Uh, Bigfoot example. Um, when we when we speak about uh, the lack of evidence um, here, when we're talking about there's a lack of evidence for for believing in God, for believing the existence of God, 
what we're saying is um, that there's a lack of evidence where we should expect to find it. And I like to use the Bigfoot example because I think that illustrates it nicely. I mean, why do we um, not believe that Bigfoot exists? Okay, well, it's not because it's logically impossible for there to be such a critter, right? It's logically possible that, that there could be such a critter. Uh, but is it actual? Is there, any, in fact, any actual um, critter running around the Canadian woods that is describable as Bigfoot? And if there were such a creature running around, what we would find uh, is we would find hair samples, we would find stool samples, uh, we would find bones. There should be something in our fossil record that sort of links us and other hominids to these creatures. We don't find such things. We don't find their skeletons. We don't find their bodies. We don't find any living or dead specimens. Um, you know, in, in all of these centuries in North America, we, we should expect by now to have found one that's been hit by a train, hit by a car, shot by a hunter, uh, frozen uh, and starved to death in, in, in the snow, uh, drowned and washed up on a shore. Uh, we should find their scats. We should find hair samples of them. We do this for all kinds of other creatures. Um, we should find their dens. Um, we should find more than blurry photographs and easily faked footprints that, by the way, never lead to the critter, uh, even though hunters routinely stalk animals right to them so that they can hunt them. Um, we have trail cams all over our woods now. Uh, people have cameras in, in their phones, and I mean, we should be we should be just seeing tons of these things, but we're just not finding the evidence that we would expect to find if Bigfoot existed. Now, to not find evidence that you would expect to find under circumstances where you would expect to find such evidence is evidence of the absence of that critter. So an absence of evidence is not a proof of absence, but an absence of evidence is evidence of absence when you should expect to find that evidence. I mean, what else could possibly be evidence for the absence of something other than the, an absence of evidence where you would expect to find it? So in the case of some religions, some religious claims, <clears throat> pardon me, um, you know, we should expect to find certain things. You know, we should expect to find an ark sitting on top of Mount Ararat or something like that. We should expect to find um, uh, conclusive uh, geological evidence um, of a worldwide flood. We should expect to find, um, you know, the, the remains of, of Sodom and Gomorrah. We should expect to find, uh, you know, all kinds of things. There's all kinds of, you know, we should expect to find evidence of an exodus out of Egypt, of, of however many uh, hundreds or thousands of Jews fled Egypt allegedly to, to come into the promised land, right? We should be able to find this evidence of them wandering in the desert for 40 years. So uh, this is all evidence that is missing that we should expect to find um, that I think um, uh, bespeaks the falsity of that particular religion. And you can do this for other religions. Uh, now, some conceptions of God are so vague, so rarefied that I, I think it then becomes very, very hard to point to to where we should expect to find evidence. I mean, if, if the concept of God is so vague that it makes no empirical predictions about what we should expect to find, well, then there's nothing that we should expect to find. But if there's nothing that we should expect to find, there can't be any confirmation of that God. And now it exists as a bare possibility, as a mere logical possibility. Are you talking about unfalsifiability? Yeah, I'm talking about gods that are so rarefied and... Um, uh, and unspecific in their empirical implications, that there's no way to to confirm them or disconfirm them. They are, in fact, unfalsifiable. Uh, and I mean, one can actually, as a theist, can sort of play the game of sort of defining God in such a way that it absolutely defies detection. Um, and consequently, the, the evidence amounts to little more than there are people who believe such a thing or who attest that they have had certain private ineffable, incommunicable experiences, which are, again, not good reasons for anyone else to believe these things and not particularly good reasons for the person in question to believe what they, what they say they believe. A lot, so, like, a lot like the invisible green dragon in my garage that Matt Dillahunty likes to point out. Uh, speaking of Matt Dillahunty, he is a fan of saying something that has left me scratching my head on several occasions. Uh, as you've said, we could posit anything. So we provisionally reject them all until the evidence gives us good reason to accept them. But there could be a case where somebody has good reasons to believe something for them. It's justified for them. Have you ever heard of one of those cases? Uh, yeah, I can't think of a case in the, in the, in the case of theism of, uh, of, of an instance where someone actually had um, uh, an experience 
um, that was in fact self-authenticating, that would in fact um, uh, justify uh, or fully warrant the belief. And the difficulty as I see it is that um, these private, uh, ineffable, incommunicable experiences that people sometimes talk about, that they say that they're simply not able to doubt. I, I think if you're not able to doubt it, <laughs> it's really for want of trying. Um, I, I mean, I can I can make myself um, uh, entertain doubts on just about everything that I believe. Um, now, I'm not. I don't always, in fact, muster a sincere doubt, but I can at least entertain um, uh, doubts about these things, um, at least hypothetically. Uh, the suggestion that something is, in fact, indubitable well there's a couple of things wrong with that first of all i'm a little bit dubious of people who say that something is in, indubitable in their experience um and the, the other thing is that indubitability the inability to muster a doubt is never evidence of the veracity of a proposition the fact that i can't muster a doubt about something is that's not a reliable indicator of the veracity of what it is that i can't doubt so um, people shouldn't be putting their confidence or trust in that or staking their theology or their religious faith on that. I mean, I, I think they're making a mistake when they do that. Uh, but the other problem is that, um, and this is a problem that we atheists face all, all the time, is we're, we're sort of, we're a little anxious when people talk about the religious experience and we'll say things like, well, look, so I'm not challenging your experience. You know, I'm not challenging your experience here. I'm not doubting your experience. And that's okay so far as it goes. If all you mean by that is, I don't, I don't doubt that you had an experience. That's fine. But it doesn't follow that because they had an experience, the object of their experience is real, right? You can think of these things. It could be like a phantom limb pain, right? If I have my arm severed, amputated, um, and it heals over, um, a, a person who has had a limb amputated can continue to feel a pain where the limb is not anymore. This is known as phantom limb pain. They can feel their arm itching or tingling. They can sometimes feel like they're clenching their fist when they're not. They can feel all kinds of pains, it can be, it, and it can be horrifying pain in some instances. Um, and <clears throat> now, if a person reports that they're feeling a certain experience of pain, well, okay, you're having a pain. When you're having a pain, you're having a pain. I, I'm, it's not up to me to say that you're not experiencing pain. When you, you tell me you're experiencing pain, I'll take you at your word. But if you tell me that, in fact, your hand is burning, um, or that your fist is clenching so hard that it's that it's that, that it's aching. I can look at your <laughs> there and say, well, I'm sorry, but the the objective correlates of what you're describing are not there to be found. This is simply uh, something going on in in your individual psychology. And when people claim that they have an experience that is resulting from God, what they're saying is that the 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 experience that they're having is caused by or occasioned by the existence of this God. It does not follow that because you have this experience, it is occasioned by uh, by such a being. It might be, it could be, but that's not a reason for me to take it um, and, and run with it. And it's not even a good reason for that particular individual to take it and run with it and assume these sort of fairly extravagant metaphysical entities actually exist on the basis of experiences that they're not able to test independently, um, that um, they cannot corroborate with other people. Um, and, and the fact that there are other people that will attest to to having experiences that are of a similar nature is no different than when people attest that they have been uh, visited by aliens and abducted or that they've seen Bigfoot and stuff like that. I mean, this, this is just not very good um, uh, reason. This, this is this is sort of subjective evidence in the pernicious sense, in the in the worrisome sense. It is merely subjective evidence that they that does not in fact lead them reliably to the conclusion that the object or what they think is the cause of their experience exists. Okay, objective correlates, independent verification, these are all big terms. So when distinguishing between good reasons and bad reasons, how do you help somebody make sure they have the good ones? Um, well, it helps here to know something about sort of human nature and human psychology and study um, you know, comparative religions um, and to know something about cognitive biases and just facts about human psychology and how susceptible we are to to uh, uh, making errors uh, and things like confirmation bias. Um, I mean, the, the more that one knows about other religions and how other religions uh, base their claims on similar first-person attestations, and yet they can't all be true, right? I think that is strongly corrosive of a person's uh, or should be strongly corrosive of a person's own experience. Uh, not that they've had the experience, but that the, that the experience points to what they think that it points to, because that's really what's at issue. 
it is the experience that you're having is isn't in fact veridical does it in fact point to what you think it points to and when you can look around and indicate all these other people who report similar kinds of experiences either aesthetic experiences uh, what they think to be uh, private communications, the seeing of signs, um, things like that. Uh, when you can point to other religions uh, and people give the same kinds of reasons, uh, but come to completely different metaphysical conclusions about what caused them, any person who is reporting to you these kinds of experiences, that should give them pause. I think if they're rational, they should not be privileging their own experience that way and saying my experiences of these things are good and those people are just all out to lunch. Uh, and and if they want to say, well, no, I'm not judging theirs as out to lunch, well, they need to make up their mind because if you're having an experience that says that there's only one true God and you've got got it and they've got another experience uh, indicating another God, you can't both be right. One of you is wrong. And you, you need some principal reason for thinking um, that that you are the the, the one who's in possession of the experiences that in fact correspond to reality and that their experiences are mere experiences that don't correspond to reality. So I think it's a matter of, of sort of instilling a, a sense of intellectual modesty and our own epistemological limitations here so that people look around at other people and say, hey, you know what? The fact that I've had these experiences is absolutely unremarkable. All kinds of other people are having similar experiences and reaching completely different conclusions and at every bit as confident, uh, subjectively speaking, that their uh, their experiences are being delivered by what they think they're being delivered by. Uh, I think if you can do that, 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 that kind of helps. I mean, it's a big job. You don't just sort of talk someone out of their, their confidence in their experience. Uh, and the longer they've had such experiences and, the, and the, the, the more they have staked in their lives, the more they have structured and organized their, their lives around um, such things, um, the harder it is for them to sort of look back at, at, at these things objectively and think, well, maybe I, I, I made a mistake. Uh, when one becomes invested in, the, uh, in one's beliefs, um, as one should, um, and when that happens, it's, it's hard to sort of uh, – back out of uh, something that you've you've just marched into uncritically. True words have never been spoken. So when an atheist finally does get some good reasons to disbelieve, what's the difference between giving good reasons to disbelieve and outright disproving? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Could you uh, just rephrase it a little bit? I'm not sure I, I sure. take your point. What's the difference between giving good reasons to disbelieve and disproving? Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, well, uh, giving good reasons to disbelieve really consists of giving uh, reasons that would undermine a person's confidence. Um, rationality isn't just conforming to certain norms, right? Logical norms and inductive norms. It's, it's not just a matter of of having um, of using reason in a way that conforms to our norms of rational and civil discourse. It also rationality also consists of having your confidence scale with the quantity and the quality of your edu your um I was say education of your um of your evidence um the the better your your evidence the better your reasons uh the more confident you deserve to be about it and uh the worse your evidence the less confident you, you should be you you either believe something or you don't but I mean, the fact that you believe something or don't doesn't mean you either believe it 100% or you don't believe it at all. I mean, it's, there's this enormous um, spectrum in between of beliefs where you're incredibly confident about which you have virtually no doubts, beliefs that you hold extremely tentatively, extremely guardedly, and then other beliefs that you feel fairly confident about or not so confident about. Um, so beliefs uh, uh, admit not only of, of degrees of of confidence, but they they admit of degrees of provisionality. You know how confident and how provisional and how tentative or guarded I am about a belief depends on how much evidence I have and the quality uh, of, of that. And so, if I wanted to undermine a, a person's belief in, you know, say their belief in Bigfoot or something like that, I would introduce them to what what I think are the reasons um, um, for for doubting that. I mean, I would, I would point to the lack of evidence where one would expect to find it. I would point to the fact that um, um, uh, the mere or bare possibility of something existing is not a reason to think that it does exist, that one, that, that we cannot operate on the principle that something is to be accepted unless it can be disproven. This is just a, a bad uh, epistemological principle. Um, 
And then I would point to um, the kinds of things that would explain why people would believe very strongly in, in these things that are so dubious. Um, so I, I think that's what it amounts to. Um, it, you, you, know, you really never have to go as far as disproving something conclusively um, to disabuse a person of what you think is a false belief any more than you have to conclusively prove something to someone in order to get them to accept a belief as most likely true. You're really just trying to move a person um, when you when you agree or disagree with them. You're, you're just trying to move them on the basis of, of good reasons and good evidence, either toward your position um, um, or away from a position that, that you think is mistaken. And, uh, and you, you, one never knows exactly what's going to be sort of the the, the, the fly in the ointment that, that you know, finally is um, so distracting that it, that it can't be ignored. And um, eventually that, that can prove to be the, the straw that breaks the camel's back. To, so, in so, metaphor, so. <laughs> so in so doing, on, on the God question, that's, that's as much of a dichotomy as it gets, right? I mean, either God exists or he doesn't. So when a theist asks me what I believe, you said that might not be relevant to even tell him what I believe. Why is that? Oh, yeah. Well, that's really important. Um, th this goes back to the issue of burden of justification. Um, um, if I'm having a discussion with, uh, with a theist and I ask him, you know, why do you believe in the God that you believe in, whichever God it is? And, you know, he or she can, you know, start giving me reasons. But one thing that often happens is some people are kind of peevish and, and touchy about this and they want to, they get suspicious of why you're asking and, and, you know, they'll say, well, why? Do you not believe in God? And if you say, yeah, no, I don't believe in God or, you know, then they'll try and challenge you by saying, well, you know, you've got to prove that God doesn't exist. Well, everyone, I think, in, in the atheistic community sort of understands that that's a ridiculous move. It doesn't follow that because I, I can't disprove something that it's a reason to believe it. Um, and there's a lot of things I can't disprove, but you can't, you can't go around believing all those things that I can't disprove simply because um, I can't disprove them. That's just... You know, there's an infinity of those, and they contradict one another, <laughs> uh, so they can't all be true. Um, so that doesn't constitute a reason to believe something. So that kind of burden shifting move is sort of is wrong off uh, off the bat. But it's important to sort to remind a person who pulls that kind of move that my particular views um, has nothing to do with them being able to discharge the burden of their justification. If I ask you why do you believe that there's a God, I want to know why you believe that there's a God. And if they say well, why why, why do you not believe? I can say, well, listen, I, I, if you want to know, I can tell you, but I don't see what my position has any, anything to do with your justification. I mean, I don't even need to exist for you to, to, uh, to believe what you believe. And surely my views have nothing to do with why you believe what you believe. So I don't need to be here at all for you to have, a, have reasons for justifying your belief. In fact, I could even share your belief. I could be a, a fellow Muslim or fellow Christian or, or Hindu or whatever, and I could be asking you, why do you believe what you believe? I mean, does it not happen that, that people within a faith community ask each other, what are your reasons for believing, you know, or what convinces you that, that God exists or that Allah is, um, is the only God and Muhammad is his prophet or, you know, whatever? I mean, what convinces you? You, you, can, you can ask these things, and people shouldn't take umbrage. They should be prepared to say, yeah, here, here's why I, I, uh, I don't think that uh, – uh, why I think that uh, such a God exists. And it really ha has nothing to do with the discharging or satisfying the burden of their justification to ask the other person what they believe. Um, now, if a person asks me what, what I think, I have, a, I have a decision to make. I can either sort of play my cards close to my chest and not tell them what, what my views are because perhaps, for instance, I fear that I, we're going to get into this burden tennis uh, where they're going to – you know, if, if I put my position out on the table – I'm going to take on a burden of justification, and then they're going to forget that they have theirs, and they're going to want to talk about my position. Um, so I might want to play my cards close to my chest. But I can also say, you know what? Yeah, I'm perfectly happy to tell you what my position is, that I don't think that there's a God, and here are my reasons why I think that there's no God. Uh, but that doesn't get you off the hook, because this idea of burden tennis that people play is predicated on the idea that in a conversation, only one person has a burden of justification, and that's false. I mean, if there's three people in the room, and they have three different positions on, on questions, you know, uh, or ten different ten people with ten different uh, positions. What, is, is there only one person in that room that has a burden of justification? No. The person who has a burden of justification is the person who's making a claim about reality. When you make a claim about reality, you either have reasons for, for believing that claim or you don't. Um, 
And if you do, you need to put them out there when, when you're asked. Um, you don't have to. This is not a moral obligation. This is a logical obligation. It's a condition of rationality that you be able to warrant or justify your beliefs. So if I'm asked, I'll I'll say, well, look, I'm happy to tell you what my reasons are if you if you care to know what they are. Uh, but that doesn't discharge your burden. You have your burden for justifying your position. I have my burden for justifying my position. And I'm happy to say as an atheist that I think that the burden of justifying my position is fairly light, fairly easy. Whereas the burden of justifying the Olympian gods or the, the entire pantheon of, of, of Hindu gods or the, the triune god of Christianity or the god of Judaism or Islam or any of those, I think the burden of justifying those positions is much, much heavier. Um, and so, I mean, it's it's not like everyone has the same burden of justification. Um, uh, so that's another thing that's sort of um, another sort of moving part in this complicated argument where a lot of people uh, assume that if two people disagree on a matter, um, they have the same burden of justification. No, no, no. That's not true. You have the burden of justifying the position that you hold to the degree of confidence that you hold it. So the if the other person says, I can prove there's a God, I know there's a God, I'm certain there's a God, wow, okay, well, you better have some darn fine reasons. They better be really convincing. Um, they can't. They better not be probabilistic reasons, for instance. Uh, but if they say, "Well, no, I think there's a God. I think it's highly probable there's a God." Okay, well, great. Now that okay, the burden is, is, has dropped a little. It's not as high as it was if they had said um, the other thing. Um, uh, but if they ask me, "Why am I an atheist?" and and you know, what do I think about God? If I say God's an impossibility, oh well, all gods or just some gods. No, all gods are impossible. Oh, okay. Well, now that's a very huge burden of justification. Heavy lifting required. Um, yeah. light, light as it may be, could you give us your justifications for your position personally? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, the, the burden of justification for my atheism, of course, uh, depends on what gods we're talking about. All gods or specific gods. Uh, in the case of, of some gods, I mean, I think... Um, I mean, they're just <laughs> some religions. Uh, some religions, I think, are defeated. I think, you know, the the, the Abrahamic faiths are defeated. You know, there's evidence in history and archaeology and science that I, I think just defeats those that leaves those religions completely wanting. I think that they, those are effectively disproven. So if you ask me how confident I am that Christianity is false, you know, I, I am as it, it, it's it's. It's almost up there with Harry Potter, in my view. <laughs> um, it, it, it's a largely invention with um, <laughs> enough fact in there um, um, so that it's sort of kind of like the Homeric myths. There's a little bit of fact in there. Um, well, more than a little bit. A little bit is overstating it. But there's some fact, but there's just far too much fiction uh, in there. So I, I think it's just not – it's not on. So I think that that is um, – that I can, uh, I, I can refute. Um, but then there are sort of other conceptions of God, you know, pantheism, or some forms of deism, um, that I think that the claims are weaker, uh, they're milder, they're often made more tentatively. It's it's harder to uh, refute those gods. So um, the reason I think that that there are no gods is um, – I'm going to state these sort of generally. Uh, I, I would point to the lack of evidence where one um, ought to expect to find it, as I mentioned before. I'd point to internal contradictions, such as the logical incoherence within a concept of God. Some specific gods or categories of gods uh, um, uh, posit that the gods in question have certain attributes, you know, the omni-attributes and stuff like that, omniscience, omnipotence, uh, that sort of thing. And I think that some of these attributes just don't go together. They're, they're, some of them are mutually contradictory, especially when you take into account the stories that they tell about these gods. Um, specifically. Um, and so these are incoherent gods. Um, so if you can find internal contradictions, you can establish that the, the concept is incoherent. So that god is now sort of off the table. Um, uh, one could point out um, contradictions between what the concept of, of, of a god implies and what we actually observe in the world. Okay. Um, and so those would be external contradictions. Uh, we sometimes do this with the problem of evil or the problem of suffering. You know, people posit a god that's all good and all powerful, and um, uh, but then why is there suffering? Um, it's, it's rather hard to reconcile these. And then the counter argument is, you know, people try to argue free will is a sort of a, a higher good that, that um, 
the counters or subordinates all other considerations about suffering. Um, uh, but I think those arguments can be countered. So I, I think contradictions internal and external um, are reasons for rejecting uh, most of the gods. And then in the absence of all of that, with all the sort of the, the other gods that are left over that are that make less specific claims about the nature of God and his role in history and, and his, his, his role in, in the creation, in the absence of, of all that with these more rarefied gods, I think one can point to how something being a mere or bare logical possibility, that that isn't a reason to affirm that it's even provisionally true or even plausible. And that's because the number of these merely logically possible things is literally infinite. There's an infinity of these things. That's why, again, we have Russell's teapot as an example and um, uh, flying spaghetti monsters and invisible pink unicorns and things. I mean, all of these are just ways of, of, of expressing that the number of things that are logically possible, that could exist logically speaking, um, is infinite in number. But they can't all exist. They're mutually contradictory. I mean, just I mean, take the, the God of the Abrahamic faiths. I mean, you know, Christians will tell you that God is a triune God. Um, Islam will tell you that God is not a triune God. He, he's a unity, and you know, he doesn't have any parts, and he, or anything like that. Um, and uh, he doesn't. Uh, he doesn't have a son, um, who is also a God. Um, and um, so, these gods contradict one another as defined, uh, which means that if, if, if one god existed, it would mean all the other gods don't exist. Um, and you can do this again and again for various sorts of gods. I mean, th these gods as defined are mutually incompatible with one another. So there's this literal infinity of logically possible extravagant metaphysical entities for which we have no evidence, that most of which are mutually incompatible with each other. If I have no basis on which to privilege some as existing over others, I have no reason for accepting any of them because I can't accept them all, right? I can't accept them all because they're mutually incompatible. So I have to pick and choose. But on what basis will I pick and choose? Well, it's going to come down to good reasons and good evidence, in which case it's back to the court of the other person to tell me what are your good reasons and your good evidence. I need to hear the, the evidence for why you think this specific God exists. And barring that, I have to reject all of them because I can't accept them all. They are, they, all they are is bare possibilities, as, as uh, Bertrand Russell used to call them. Um, and if we try to accept them all, we bloat our entire ontology, our theory of everything that exists. We would bloat it with a literal infinity of mutually incompatible things. We would have an incoherent view of reality. Um, so I, I think that this is why I'm an atheist. Uh, there are reasons having to do with the lack of evidence where we would expect to find it, internal contradictions, external contradictions, and the fact that I, I can't bloat my, my ontology with things that are merely logically possible. I need reasons, specific reasons for specific posits to be admitted into my ontology, into my worldview, into my theory of what actually exists. And so we, again, we come back to to evidence. And I think this is how uh, an atheist can discharge his or her burden of justification. Notice that this doesn't constitute a proof of the impossibility of a god. Um, I don't have such a proof, but I don't need such a proof to, 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 uh, to be rationally warranted in the conclusion that there isn't a god. It can all get pretty meta when you start thinking about it. Um, so in a word, it sort of helps to use shorthanded definitions and labels, uh, theism talking about what you believe, Gnosticism going to what you know, in a word, which are you? Or do you find them useful at all? Um, well, uh, the whole sort of um, the typology um, that, that people talk about, about, you know, you can be a Gnostic theist or an agnostic theist, you can be a Gnostic atheist or an agnostic atheist. I, I don't find that particularly helpful. I mean, that is a, um, um, I mean, Ask a person who's um, who believes that there's no God, who's prepared to say there's no God, like, such as myself. Am I a Gnostic atheist or am I an agnostic atheist? Well, I'm prepared to say that there's no God for the same reason I'm prepared to say there's no Bigfoot. But it's not because I think I can prove there's no Bigfoot or I can prove there's no God, right? I mean, so am I a Gnostic atheist only if I think I can prove that all gods are absolute impossibilities? You know, well, okay, well, then there's almost no 
Gnostic atheists. Um, I, I, I think that that typology is, is not particularly useful. I mean, we used to speak of strong atheists and weak atheists, but I mean, who wants to call themselves a weak atheist, right? It, it sounds sort of self-deprecating to call yourself a weak atheist. We used to have positive and negative atheists. It, it was a sort of the same kind of line. Um, and, you know, people didn't like that. Who wants to be called a negative atheist? It sounds like you're saying something negative about yourself. Um, and so people went with Gnostic and agnostic. Uh, and, and that's fine as far as it goes, but I don't think the typology is very helpful because, you know, uh, really what it comes down to is um, what you believe is what d determines your burden of justification coupled with your confidence to what degree um, you're confident in that claim. Uh, the higher the confidence, the better uh, reasons you have. So it doesn't matter if you call yourself an agnostic atheist. You don't escape any any burden of, of justification. You just have a lesser burden of justification than the Gnostic, uh, the so-called Gnostic atheist. Um, but I, I, would, I would sort of hastily add that, that um, a, a lot of people like to sort of uh, take the word agnostic and subsume it under the heading of atheist. And I, that I think is a is a mistake. Um, uh, the reason for doing this is that um, a, a certain uh, definition of atheism that I call lack theism, that atheism is the mere lack of a belief in a god. Well, it's certainly true that every atheist lacks a belief in a god. That's absolutely true. Uh, but in the English language and in modern languages, atheism has never been understood um, to be a mere lack of a belief, but rather the rejection of theism, um, the denial of theism. And you can look this up in any philosophical dictionary or any dictionary in the philosophy of religion or theology. And that's where this discourse takes place. Um, and we don't just get to sort of co-opt the word and redefine it the way we like. You can redefine it any way you like, but you don't avoid a burden of justification. You can call yourself anything. You can you can you can say you know, uh, I am an atheist, and by atheist I mean a mere lack of belief. But if you're also going around saying gods aren't real and gods a delusion and gods a myth, well, I'm afraid you're. However, you define your atheism, you are still incurring the same burden of justification as an atheist um, would who uses the more traditional uh, and extant definition of atheism. So I, I think sort of the breakdown about you know agnostic atheist and gnostic athe uh, atheist I, I, I don't think that's particularly helpful and I think it's it does a disservice to people who self-identify as agnostics on the question of God's existence uh, those people really uh, resent being told that they are a species of atheist uh, and they're right to resent it because these are people who have come to the conclusion that no I am not more confident that there's no God than I am that there is a God and so while you can say, yes, but you lack a belief in a God if you're an agnostic, but they can say, yeah, but I also lack a belief that there's no God. I'm on the fence. That's what it is to be an agnostic. I, I can't make up my mind, either because I don't have the evidence in hand to make up my mind presently, uh, and it might be a temporary condition, or because as like a Huxleyan agnostic, I think that no one will ever have the evidence required to decide one way or the other. So those people are are on the fence, and they are no more accurately described as atheists than they would be described as theists. Because a theist could come along and say, oh, you lack a belief as an agnostic. You as an agnostic lack a belief in the non-existence of God. If you lack a belief in the non-existence of God, that makes you a theist, right? I mean, both sides can play this, right, in this tug of war to try to get the agnostics on their, under their under their tent, and I, I, I don't think there's any reason to do that. We already have a word for this lack theism, okay? This this lack of a belief uh, in a god. This word has been around since at least the 1850s. It's as old as the word agnosticism, and that word is non-theism. Non-theism has been around for a long time. It describes everyone who lacks a belief in a god. That describes atheists who think there's no god. It describes agnostics who are uncertain. It describes igtheists or um, cognitive, uh, or rather, um, theological non-cognitivists um, who think that uh, no one can even get as far as um, believing a god or believing there's no god. <laughs> they think theism and atheism are both, you know, kind of wonky uh, ideas uh, because the whole discourse is um, uh, incoherent. Um, so the word non-theism captures all of those. I mean, it's the same thing as lack theism. Uh, so. 
there's a reason why the, a word like like non-theism sort of doesn't catch on, and it's because, or I mean, it has caught on, but it's not very widely used. It's because it's not descriptive. If a person asks you, uh, Brian, you know, where do you stand on the issue of God, God's existence, and you say, Oh, I'm a non-theist. I lack a belief in, ex in the existence of God. They're going to say, yeah, okay, but now, what's your position, though? <laughs> uh, are you uncertain? Do you think there is or do you think there isn't? To say <laughs> that I'm a you – know, or do you think the whole discourse is crackers and that no one is, can actually be, rationally speaking, a theist or an atheist, right? Um, so the, the, the word non-theist doesn't do any work, and to define atheism – as a mere lack of a belief means that you are just subsuming a whole bunch of people with actually different attitudes, different views on the question of God's existence, and you're subsuming them under one label. Well, that's okay. You can do that, but we already have a word for that, non-theism. But when a person asks, asks you why you, you, know, uh, uh, you hold the position that you hold, um, all those people in that group have a different burden of justification based on the specific position that they hold. Right. Um, so, I mean, an agnostic has a b different burden of justification than an atheist would. And it doesn't matter if you want to subsume them both under a broader heading of atheism, more broadly defined to, to be the same as lack theism or non-theism. Um, that, that, that doesn't actually help anything. No one escapes the burden of, their, of justifying their beliefs. Um, you, it is a condition of rationality that you be able to justify your beliefs if you want to claim that the beliefs – are rational. I mean, Christopher Hitchens had this wonderful line about that which uh, which is can be said or uttered um, uh, without evidence can be dismissed without evidence, and that's absolutely true. That's true for any position, any position, any claim about reality. And so, if your claim is that re religions, all religions, are false and that there are, are no gods, then that's a claim about reality. And if you think that, oh well, I don't need to justify it. Okay, well, fine, but I can dismiss that. Right, and theists, I think, are sort of right to laugh in our faces when we try to have it both ways. When we play hide the ball with our position, when we try to, in one breath, say, "I merely lack a belief," and then in the next breath, go around saying there are, that there are no gods, and gods are imaginary, and gods a, a delusion, and all of these things. I think we really are trying to have it both ways. We're trying to assert a claim about reality, and then deny that we're making a claim about reality, and thus we're evading our burden of justification. And they're not fooled for one minute, and they shouldn't be. And it behooves us as people in this movement who want to to claim the, the the epistemological high ground here and say that we're the rational ones, that we be willing to say, no, I have a justification, I, I, I have a burden of justification, and I can here is my justification. It's lighter than yours, you know. But you know, great. That's that's why I hold the position that I do. <laughs> well, it all gets pretty tribal, doesn't it? And it's, it's often framed as this us versus them. And we're, we're quick to give ire to the fence sitters from both sides. Uh, people who are sort of get labeled as a fence sitter is sort of a derogatory term. Uh, although I don't want to unfairly lump them in, talk to me about some of the fence sitters out, would be listeners out there who would describe themselves as such and, and may say they're spiritual. Is that any, does that lose any burden of proof? I, I hear the term spiritual getting tossed around, especially on college campuses. Yeah. Uh, well, I think the word spiritual is sort of a, uh, is one of those weasel words that I don't like. Uh, it's funny. I was having a conversation with a friend uh, just the other day about this. Um, uh, with respect to people who are fence sitters, first of all, when I use the word fence sitter, I don't mean it in a disparaging way. It, I mean, it, it sounds very disparaging to say fence sitter because it sounds like someone is cowardly and is unwilling to, to make a commitment. But no one has a responsibility to commit themselves to a, a philosophical position, which is what this is, uh, unless they actually have a reason to think that that position is true. And so people who are fence sitting by and large are people who are just sort of intellectually honest enough to say, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not in a position to know. I don't feel I have uh, what's necessary uh, to know it here. Um, and, uh, and then you have people who think no one will ever know uh, what's need, what, what needs to what, what one needs to know? Well, no one will ever have the evidence required to rationally warrant a conclusion one way or the other. And it's nothing to do with certainty, by the way. When I say no, I don't mean that you have to be certain. I just mean uh, sufficient evidence to, to to warrant a conclusion one way or the other. So the Huxleyan agnostics, and then you have ichthyists who think that 
no, the like the question is just meaningless. Like all talk of, I mean, the, the word God is meaningless. The word theism is meaningless. The word agnostic is meaningless. And the word the, atheist is meaningless. These are all meaningless terms uh, because the whole con- discourse of, of uh, about God is a meaningless discourse. Um, those, uh, all of those people, um, uh, I, I don't think are properly described as uh, as atheists. Um, uh, so, the fence sitters, I mean, I mean, you can sort of describe them less pejoratively as provisional agnostics. These are people who, at least for the time being, think. I don't know which way to go on this. Maybe someday I'll, I'll, I'll change my mind, but right now I don't know which way to go. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not prepared to affirm either proposition. And so I'm not prepared to be, to allow myself to be identified as belonging to one, one group or the other. That um, I don't want to be associated uh, with that. The fly in the ointment here is that there are people who run away from the word atheism and atheist because it has negative connotations. It's been stigmatized. And fearing that stigma, they think that they can avoid either a burden of justification or that they can avoid the social uh, penalties of self-identifying as an atheist by calling themselves an agnostic. Um, uh, the the, the uh, astronomer uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson springs to mind. Here is a person who, based on everything he's ever said, is, is really... <laughs> in his more candid moments, very obviously an atheist. Sure. But because of his public role, it does not want to embrace that word. And so he self-identifies as an agnostic. That is the kind of, of thing that worries some people and that has led a lot of us to think in our movement that, uh, you know what, these agnostics, you know, they're just, they're just being cowardly. They're just, they're playing hide the ball with their position. They don't want mm. to admit what they actually feel. And there are such people, and that's really unfortunate, but it's a mistake to think that everyone who self-identifies as an agnostic is in fact um, just um, uh, uh, temporizing and trying to avoid uh, a, uh, a label that has stigmatizing uh, properties. Not everyone is like that. Uh, I wasn't. I mean, I remember. I, I mean, I, I started out as a fundamentalist um, and, a, and a creationist, and you know, the, the whole ball of wax, uh, the full catastrophe. Um, and uh, I mean, I tumbled out of my faith, and on the way out of my faith, I, I went into sort of a more moderate form of Christianity and then an ever more liberal view and then a kind of deistic view and then a, like a, a, com- a complete agnosticism where I just simply could not make up my mind. And that lasted not terribly long, but I mean, I was really kind of stuck there and unable to, to, to commit. And then at some point I just realized, you know what? I think that I have a better reason there's no God than there is a God. And then, you know, at that point I was, I was uh, an atheist. Now I didn't have the, I have to confess, I didn't have the particularly good reasons. Uh, I was young at the time and I had some bad arguments uh, in my head. Um, but I mean, a lot of people come to agnosticism um, quite honestly and not because they're trying to avoid some negative connotations. With respect to spirituality, um, I think a lot of people use that word. I think that that is one of the words that, that, that people um, are sometimes uh, are, are being a little weaselly uh, with. Uh, the word spiritual um, uh, it covers so much. It's, a lot of people just want to say, I believe in a God and I have certain faith or religious commitments, but I don't want to be associated with organized religions. So they'll say I'm spiritual. You know, so they they sort of they take their cue not from any particular organization that dictates a dogma or a set of creeds, but they sort of make it up as they go along. They sort of, you know, they're getting a vibe from nature or something like that, or they, they feel that there's a you know, a still small inner voice in them that guides them and stuff like that. And they, they believe in rather metaphysically extravagant things. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, and that would be okay. That would be kind of a new agey view, perhaps. I, I mean, you know, fine, you want to call yourself spiritual. That's okay. Um, part of the problem, part of my, my discomfort with the word spiritual is that um, a lot of people try to sort of water down the word spiritual uh, to make it sound like it's just – a love of nature, you know, being awed by nature and feel, feeling inspired by certain aesthetic experiences and, and things like that. And then next thing you know, it turns out that I, because I love camping and I love nature and I love the outdoors, it turns out that I'm a spiritual person too, you know, and the next thing you know, I'm, I'm right in there being lumped in with someone like Oprah Winfrey, who has just a, a raft of, of preposterous ideas. Um, and uh, Deepak Chopra comes to mind. As yeah. openly endorse him. Yeah, yeah, uh, and and you know books like The Secret and and stuff like mm-hmm. that. I mean, 
So, I mean, I mean, this really is equivocating on, on the word spiritual. If the word spiritual just means um, having certain kinds of very human um, experiences that are that are sort of well understood and well documented as uh, features of human psychology in the presence of certain kinds of stimulations, um, then that then fine. Then I'm spiritual in that sense. But that is no sense of spiritual. That that's not the same sense of spiritual that that other people are talking about, sort of in the New Age movement. Um, and so I, I think the word spiritual is something that. That a lot of people run to because they 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 have religious sensibilities, but the word religion, like the word atheism, in, in some quarters, is just tarred. It's just so tarnished, so so larded and freighted with negative connotations that they don't want anything to do with it, and so they call themselves spiritual. Sort of the last stop on somebody tumbling down the rabbit hole, which I'm sure anybody who was grew up Christian and ended up atheist can all relate to. <clears throat> Speaking about I don't know, saying I don't know, there's there's a certain admiration to be had there for someone who can just admit that isn't there because ultimately that's what science prides itself on, the ability to admit I don't know when you actually don't know. And I, oftentimes we'll get into arguments with Christians who take that as a gotcha moment. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, uh, all science <laughs> all, and all philosophy begins with the frank admission that one doesn't know something. <laughs> um, and it's, it's rather hard to look for the truth when you think you've already got it in your back pocket. Uh, it's hard to motivate yourself to test your beliefs and to challenge your beliefs and question them and re-examine them. Um, uh, one tends to just find confirmation when one thinks one's got the, the, the truth all locked up. Um, so, um, you know, a willingness to say, I don't know, I think is actually quite commendable provided you in fact honestly think that you don't know. Yeah, you know, there are people out there who sometimes feel very confident about a proposition but will sometimes feign more doubt than they have. That's not any better than feigning certainty. Pretending that you don't know when you do know, when you think you do know, uh, when you're very confident uh, of something, um, that's that's not any better than feigning certainty when you in, are in fact not at all certain or in no position to be certain. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of dishonesty with uh, with respect to I don't know, but it has to be said that that being able to admit that you don't know when you honestly don't know is should never be taken as a gotcha moment and should never be held against you. And and I mean, this is one of the liabilities of the discourse of faith, as I see it, is that it encourages, it valorizes, it, it makes into a virtue not having doubts, not entertaining doubts. It it it, it has a tendency to to in, encourage a person to think that the having of doubts and misgivings and second thoughts um, and challenging your own views, that this is a, this is backsliding, that it's, that it, it's immoral. Um, uh, when faith and, and strong confidence is valorized as a kind of virtue, especially a moral virtue, but also an epistemological virtue, uh, then we run into all kinds of, uh, of problems. We, we run into people feigning certainty, having false certainty. Um, and uh, that I think is a is a, a terrible thing, and it discourages people from learning and um, and expanding their horizons and, and challenging their own beliefs. Um, what we want actually is to encourage people to frankly admit their epistemological limits. I mean, what this amounts to is a, is intellectual honesty, uh, and that means acknowledging your epistemological limits and being able to say, you know. I understand this, and here's how I understand it, and here's why I believe it, and here's why I think there are good reasons. And when you have a belief, and we all have this, we're all in the same boat in this respect. We all have beliefs that we do not know how, how to justify very well. We're all in sort of the position of feeling very confident about certain claims that we really have not thought through very well. We've just sort of inherited these beliefs. We sort of drunk them in with our mother's milk and our culture, and we don't know how to justify them very well. And yet we feel confident about them. In fact, we might even organize our lives around these. These could be our, our moral beliefs, our political beliefs uh, very often. And um, these are often presuppositions, things you just take to be true that you never particularly critically examined, uh, but you're confident there just must be some good reasons. You've just never gotten around to it, you know. Um, and uh, part of, of of being intellectually modest and intellectually honest is recognizing your epistemological limitations and recognizing that, yeah, I, as a matter of fact, no matter how rational I strive and aspire to be, I'm in fact always acting on uh, assumptions that I'm making that I have not thoroughly examined uh, and might never get around to. That's not a license to do it. 
it's just an admission that we do it. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, th there's no shame in admitting it. And nobody should be using that as a license to believe more fantastical things. And that's the worry that people have. A lot of people worry that if they admit that they have uh, beliefs that are sort of at the core of their of their worldview, at the, at the, at the sort of the, the, the heart of the, their web of belief, that if they admit that some of those uh, beliefs are in fact commitments that they don't know how to justify and rationally warrant, that if they admit that, they will be licensing everybody else to believe any old damn thing. But that doesn't follow. And you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to, I mean, it, it, it's simply a non sequitur. If, if it turns out that I believe something and I don't have good reasons for believing these things, and uh, there's a bunch of them, I can name them, um, that is not a license for anyone else to believe in you know, Bigfoot or anything else. Because it's not a license for me to believe what I believe. It's not a license for you. Um, that, that, that's not how it works. Um, and it's not hypocrisy to point out, hey, you know what? You don't have good reasons for believing what you believe. You know, even if I'm in, in that boat myself of having things that I believe that I'm not able to discharge rationally, um, that is a fact that we need to admit. We need to be honest about this. And and people who self-identify as critical thinkers and skeptics and rational people, we above everybody else should be prepared to admit this and not be afraid to admit it. We should not be allergic to words like belief and faith. We all believe things, um, and we all have beliefs that are mere beliefs that we don't even know how to discharge um, uh, if we think sort of deeply uh, about uh, these things. And that, you know, that's why I think sort of the philosophy of science and philosophy in general is, uh, you know, it's part of what gives us the, uh, the, the tools in our critical thinking toolkit, um, and it allows us to identify those things that we think we know that we don't know. You talked about the valorization of not having doubts. Is belief in the absence of evidence, otherwise known as faith, is that a dangerous thing in your opinion? Yeah, of course it's dangerous. I mean, that's why we want to minimize these things, right? I mean, if you know, the problem with with faith is that faith construed as a kind of epistemological principle or virtue or a tool for arriving at one's beliefs is is indiscriminate. Um, faith is a prostitute of the worst sort. It, it 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 lets you believe anything you want with as much confidence as you want, um, in the face of whatever conflicting evidence flies flies at you. So no, I mean faith is a is is not a good thing. That's that's what it's one of the things I dislike about the discourse of faith is this valorization of false certainty, um, and how faith allows you. Um, it, if you buy into this idea that faith is a virtue, it, it allows you to uncouple your beliefs from reality. And look, our beliefs are supposed to be our model of reality. We want our beliefs to be tethered to reality. We want there to be some reliable procedure by which we, we verify our beliefs to the degree that we can. There are some beliefs that we can't do this with. Uh, there are sort of fundamental beliefs at, at, at the core of our, of our belief set that we don't know how to justify. Um, and uh, sometimes called properly basic beliefs, um, uh, or sometimes called axioms. Um, but you know that the fact that th those exist is not a, a license to believe any old damn thing. And uh, the danger is precisely that some people will believe any old damn thing. And when we valorize believing strongly in something where the evidence doesn't warrant, that's th that's the pernicious sort of of, of irrationality. That that's. That's not just sort of believing things that you're not entitled to believe. That's even worse. What's even worse is people are believing strongly in things that they're not entitled to believe. <laughs> and I mean, that is, is so dangerous. I mean, you know, people are hitting buildings with airplanes and beheading people right now because of this kind of thing. Um, you know. does, something, does something like faith, is, is that something that runs counter to human nature? Is it something that you have to apply with both hands at all times, or is it something that comes easy, you think? Is it something that, like you said, we're taught from a young age and we drink it from our mother's milk, or is it something that would come easy, you think? Um, well, faith comes doesn't just come easy. It comes naturally. In fact, it comes effortlessly. There's there's a, a, a model that a lot of us have that we carry around that, that's wrong. We sort of think of ourselves as starting as blank slates, having no beliefs, and then evidence impinges itself upon us, and then we start to believe things. And sometimes we acquire false beliefs, but you know, it, 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 we sort of start off in a in a in a, in a position of not having um, any any beliefs, and and um, 
and, and evidence is what is what gives us our beliefs. And well, that's the story is partly true. I mean, we start off having you know <laughs> rather few beliefs, um, uh, and uh, over the course of our lives, we pick up beliefs, uh, like we sort of you know pick up clothing and furniture and stuff like that. We sort of acquire these things. We furnish our our mental life with with our beliefs, and we jettison some along the way. But we just keep acquiring more as we learn. So we start off with with nothing almost, and start and then end up with something, but the, but the model um, is is kind of wrong because we don't start off as skeptics or critical thinkers, not believing and doubting and awaiting evidence. No, no, every child starts off as a credulous. We are all credulists when we start. We all just believe what we're told. We believe what our parents tell us, um, and the, those uh, in our trusted circle tell us. We just believe it. It's why we. Believe in the tooth fairy and Santa Claus when they tell us about it. It's, just not, it's not like there's anything in our experience at that age that corroborates tooth fairies and Santa Claus. And yet, if we are told this, um, you believe it. So we, we drink in our values with our, 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 our mother's milk. And um, no one ever has to tell us our most basic values. We just sort of imbibe them. We, we see others modeling certain things. And then we just, you know, we monkey see, monkey do. We just start to do it. And we drink in those values. And similarly, we we trust what we're told we believe the stories that we're told it's uh, it's why we we believe the myths of our culture whether they're political myths or religious myths or any other kind of myth um so we start off as as credulous and and it has to be this way offspring have to trust their parents offspring start off knowing virtually nothing and couldn't get by they can't you know i mean imagine if you if, if your one-year-old just just wasn't trusting what you were doing and wasn't following your lead or your three-year-old was just not listening to what you were saying and just simply didn't believe what you said. I mean, we simply would not get by. Organisms can't get by. It, you know, you know, ducklings follow mama duck wherever she goes. They trust she knows where she's going. They just follow blindly. And that's how we start. We start off as terrible critical thinkers and we have to learn how. Um, and we only get better at it. And it's not a natural thing to be a critical thinker. It's it's natural to have a capacity for critical thinking. But to be good at critical thinking, that's not natural. It takes no one, practice. Yeah, it takes practice and it takes learning. You have to learn what a fallacy is. You have to learn what the norms of good reason are. You have to uh, learn to have a respect for evidence. All of these things you have to learn and you have to put into practice. And it's always easier to sort of apply your critical thinking tools to other people's beliefs. And it's always hardest to apply them to yourself. So it, it, none of this comes naturally. What is natural in us is a capacity for it, but not the having of it. You have to be exposed to it um, and it has to be modeled for you. And at some point, if you're lucky, you make a commitment to being better at it and you make it a value and you place it high in your index of values so that you decide – my belief set, I'm going to try to revise and re-examine according to these epistemic norms that I'm going to value. And I'm going to try try to form mental habits whereby I am quite naturally sensitive to changes in the state of the evidence so that my, my beliefs sort of – I don't have to will myself and try real hard to talk myself out of stuff and talk myself into stuff so that – it sort of happens rather naturally. And that's the lifelong project. It doesn't come naturally. A child is the definition of credulous. So in so being, is a child who is told something by his parents, say, for example, religious teachings, does that constitute taking advantage of that child? And does that warrant any kind of, dare I say, abuse? Uh yeah, I, I think it actually is a kind of abuse, but I, I don't like to use the word abuse because when people use the word you know abuse in connection with children, what comes to mind is things like child molestation. So the word child abuse is one of these words again that it's you know it it it's it's, it's charged, it's emotionally charged, it's just larded with all kinds of terrifying connotations. Um, and so you know to be to be told that hey you know you're abusing your child in this respect, um, you know what you're lumping me in with uh, you know people who who molest their children, you know, um, no one wants to be told that. So I don't like the word, uh, because, uh, in connection with this, because I think it's, it's a bit too strong. There's got, I, I don't really know a better word to be frank though, but I mean, it is certainly, it's a kind of child exploitation, but again, that word brings to mind sexual exploitation. So I, I don't know how to get around this problem, but, but yeah, I, I, we all understand that our, our children are completely vulnerable and they are at our mercy. Now, if you actually believe in a, in a pile of hogwash, whether it's new age or 
stuff or astrology, uh, Bigfoot, alien abductions, um, you know, uh, fundamentals, Christianity or something. It doesn't matter what they're what it is. If you've got a head full of nonsense, as I see it, and you sincerely believe this stuff, well, you're not lying to your children when you tell them these things that are falsehoods. Okay. Uh, I mean, lying isn't the telling of a falsehood. It's it's t deliberately trying to mislead someone and uh, and make them believe something that you don't think is true. And parents who raise their children um, to be religious, when they are themselves sincerely religious, they are not lying to their children. It's not that kind of abuse. But there is a, a, a kind of abuse here. It's a different sort, and and that is that we everybody knows that you shouldn't. Exploit your children. You shouldn't take advantage of your children's credulity, that their lack of critical faculties, right? That you shouldn't take advantage of their epistemological vulnerabilities, right? Um, it's 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 not a good thing to do. And when you are telling your kids that certain things are facts, that you yourself believe, but are not in a position to know our facts, well, now you are, in fact, telling a kind of lie. Uh, it's not that you don't believe the conclusion. It's that you don't know that it's a fact. And when we impart things as facts to our children that we're not in a position to establish as fact, even though we take them as facts, we are being epistemologically irresponsible, and we're doing our children a disservice. And so we shouldn't do that. We should we should be frank with our children and say, yeah, these are my, poli my political beliefs. These are my religious beliefs. These are my moral beliefs. These are my whatever beliefs. Uh, and, you know, when your kids say, well, why do you believe this? Uh, there comes a time when they're old enough to ask such questions. You tell them why and you give them the honest reasons. But what you don't do is, well, everybody knows that's true when you don't yourself know why that's true. <laughs> and we, there's too much of that. It's best to keep the beliefs to yourself in that case. Well, you don't have to keep the beliefs to yourself. I don't think you have to hide what you honestly believe from your children, right? I mean, I mean, if I think something, if I if I think there are dire consequences uh, for my child, you know, believing or not believing something that I happen to believe, right? I mean, if I think my child's eternal salvation rests on their having certain beliefs, of course I should tell them what I believe, and that they should believe it too. But you know, why do you have to be a liar about it? And the reason people are, are so tempted to be cavalier about the state of the evidence with their children is precisely because a lot of religions, not all religions, but a lot of religions, they posit extraordinary, terrifying metaphysical stakes. The stakes, if you believe the wrong thing, are incredibly high, you know, eternal torment or eternal happiness, right? Well, when the stakes are that high, you know, and you love your children, it, we understand why people lie. It doesn't justify it, but I mean, we fully understand why they do it. It's like taking out an insurance policy, getting them baptized and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but a baptism is something you do to your child. It's not, some, it's not a belief that you inculcate in them. Um, but, you know, by the time the child's old enough to be, you know, confirmed as a Catholic, uh, at that point, you, you really do have to pickle in a lot of dogma into them because they have to recite a catechism and, and that sort of thing um, at a certain age. And when, when you're doing that, unless you believe it and have the reasons why you think it's true, um, you don't have any you, – you really are not being honest with your children when you say it's just true and you're just presenting it um, that way. I mean if someone asks me, you know, Ozzy, is your car sitting in the driveway? Well, I have reasons why I think my car is sitting in the driveway. Um, and so, yes, I think it's true that my car is sitting in my driveway and I have reasons for thinking the car is sitting in my driveway. I, I went on an errand today and I parked it there uh, when I got home. So I feel fully, you know, honest when I say yes. There's a car in my driveway, even though, for all I know, it's been stolen and it's my driveway is empty right now. Um, but you know, there are other beliefs that I have. I have certain political commitments, for instance, that I don't really don't know how well I can justify some of those. You know, uh, you know, I feel them rather strongly, and I really would like everyone to sort of see things my way politically, because that would mean. I would get my way politically. People would all vote the same way, and politicians would enact the laws that I would like to see enacted. Uh, but I mean, it would be wrong of me to sort of pickle those into my kids as if they were data, as if we just knew these things to be truths, right? That I think is what's wrong. And the discourse of faith, in part because it 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 valorizes confidence where you have no business being confident, and because it posits metaphysical states that are so high, 
that encourages and motivates people to lie to their children like they would never dream of lying. And, and the lie specifically is not telling things that they don't think are true, but lying about the state of the evidence and the warrant that they have for their confidence. That's where the lie is. Well, I can that, think that, that I think is a form of abuse. Very well said. Well, I can think of no better note to leave it on than that. My first interview with Ozymandias Ramsey. Before you go, I'm told you have a video in the works elaborating on this subject of discharging burdens and other topics as well. Could you tell anybody listening when we could expect that and where we could find it? Um, well, I don't know when to expect it. I've been sort of promising to make that video for some time now. Um, and I, it, it's an argument that has a lot of moving parts. And um, the online atheist community is, is fairly wedded to this idea of lack theism, of atheism as a, defined as a lack of a belief. And I, it, it, it's become one of the sacred cows of online atheism. And I think completely needlessly, because I don't think we need that definition at all. It doesn't, don't, doesn't do us any favors. And I think it, it kind of embarrasses us and it makes us look not only like we're afraid to discharge our burden, but we're afraid even to state our position. Um, so I've been um, asked to sort of, you know, make a video about this for a while. Um, I don't know when I'm going to get around to it. I, I, it's, sort of, it's a script I've been working on for a long time. So I will be doing it. Uh, it'll be on my channel. Um, Ozymandias Ramsey's the second is the name of the channel. Um, and, um, but I mean, honestly, I don't know that I, I mean, I, I feel like I answered so much of, 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 what I need to do in that video here. <laughs> um, so I don't know, maybe we, I'll use parts of this or something like that. Well, it helps to have somebody playing devil's advocate going through with you, but it does sound very interesting. I would love to hear more because we don't like sacred cows here. So we would love to, I agree, we would love to parse the subject even more about how you think the definition is useless. Ozymandias Ramsey, thank you so much for your time. I'm going to stop the broadcast. Thank you.